Um, and there's a movement out there right now called shared value. It started a little bit before 2011, but most people in the shared value movement actually point to this article, and the title of it was Creating Shared Value by Michael Porter and Mark Kramer. It came out in 2011, and this, is, this kind of cemented the idea of shared value. And th these are business people, right? So these aren't designers saying we need this. This is biz businesses saying, um, you know, kind of capitalism is under siege, right? And this mistrust in corporations, we, as from, from the business side, we need to do something about it. And basically what they're saying is you need to create profit and have social benefit at the same time. That the profit imperative is not good enough in and of itself. They're talking about it actually from a, a competitive side, right? So they say to be, to be competitive, you, you need to think about how you're going to be profitable and create social value as part of your business model. Let me give you an example. For instance, um, there's a program called Sk Skype in the Classroom. And Skype in the Classroom lets teachers uh, find other instructors around the world and uh, uh, kind of build a, a innovative curricula for their students. So it actually enriches the students. So with, ev with every interaction with Skype in the Classroom, there's a benefit to Skype, but there's also then a social benefit, right? Another example, the International Hotels Group has a Green Engage program where they were um, putting environmental measures into how they ran their hotels. They ended up saving 25% of their operating costs, but then offered you know, environmental friendly hotels, which is a, a competitive differentiator for them as well too. So it's not about corporate social responsibility, right? That's, that's philanthropy, that's giving, giving money to a charity or something like this. What shared value is saying is that the way that businesses need to think and manage um, themselves now is to think about um, profit and social benefit at the same time. And I think this is, um, this is, interesting, f this is interesting for us. But it represents, it represents a fundamental shift in business thinking, right? And I don't want to suggest that, you know, times are more turbulent now than they were decades ago, because there's always change, it's just a different type of change. But I think the type of change that we're seeing here with, with notions like um, creating shared value, again, coming from the business community, I think this type of change is, is proportional to Copernicus discovering that the Earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around. Right? Through observations with very low fidelity instruments, he was able to actually create this model. I think this was the model that Vanessa was referring to in the very top of her timeline. It's an infographic, right? It's a visual representation of the solar system that he created 1543. And it's a scientific discovery, but the impact on society was actually pretty profound because it raised some existential questions for you know, a, a society, planet Earth, that thought they were the center, the center of the universe, suddenly they're not the center of the universe. Right? And suddenly, you know, we're now just the third rock from the sun. So this was a pretty, this was a pretty profound discovery. And I believe um, the shared value and the, you know, the, the sentiment of reversing our thinking, let's start with the customer experience and work our business out from there, I think that's uh, on the same proportions as this discovery. So my first point is that future survival or survival in the future requires a reversal in business thinking, right? You got to start with the experience and figure out how you're going to create value from there and not the other way around. <clears throat> so I think I just, I just tweeted that, I think, if you're following me on Twitter. <laughs> So that's my first point, and this is the point in the presentation where you might say, big fucking deal callback. What does that have to do with us? Okay. Which is fine. And let me, let me explain what I think this has to do with us. <clears throat> I want to go back to shared value and look at how Michael Porter says that companies should approach creating shared value. And this is what he said in a video interview. He's advising companies, you know, how do, how do I, how do I um, conceive of shared value when my, my imperative has always been just maximize profit? What do I need to do? He says, well, <clears throat> you need to figure out what your product is and what your value chain is. Understand where those things touch important social needs and problems. Sounds good. If you're in financial services, let's think about saving or buying a home, but in a way that actually works for the consumer. Right? Buying a home in a way that actually works for the consumer. And when I heard that, two things came to mind. One was I, I, I thought, wow, that's what I do. That's what we do, right? 
That's, that's the thing that we say our business stakeholders don't get, right? Because we're trying to do it in a way that actually works for the consumer, right? <clears throat> so I thought, wow, this, this has got to be relevant to, to UX people, to designers, this, this whole notion of shared value. Um, the second thing I thought when I heard that uh, sentence was the word actually. And it's kind of a subtle admission that business pe folks didn't necessarily think about that before. And I thought, well, if that if actually, in a way that actually works for the consumer, how were you doing it before? Were you doing it in a way that maybe not worked for the consumer but was cheap to make and easy to sell? I don't know. So <clears throat> let's think about how it actually works for the consumer. So when you think about buying a home, right, buying a home is, is a pretty big complex set of interactions and, and, and human uh, motivations and emotions and things. How do we conceive of buying a home in a way that actually works for the consumer? Well, we can, we can try to visualize it. And this is a diagram created by Sophia Hussein, who's going to speak to us tomorrow, one of our illustrious speakers, around buying a home. And what she did was she mapped out all of the behaviors and all of the interactions involved in buying a home, right? So you have selecting a neighborhood over here, determining what you can afford, finding the new home, and so forth, and then a series of related activities around those, plus some touch points with some technology, right? So with this, we're actually able to see the value chain, what our product is, in a way that actually works for the consumer. So, um, for, for designers, um, you know, and you've probably seen these types of diagrams as well before, um, what, what they ultimately do, I think it goes beyond just touch point optimization and incremental improvement. I think what this allows us to do is to talk about value so that we can actually visualize value. If we're talking about value being an exchange between an individual and an organization, we can actually visualize that and have intelligent conversations around value creation and around things like shared value with our business stakeholders. And the equation is fairly simple, right? <clears throat> we have individuals, we have people acting in the world trying to get things done, <clears throat> and they're seeking some benefit from an organization, some product or service, and where those two overlap is an exchange of value, right? So it's... <laughs> It's the interaction between an individual and an organization and the benefit that each um, uh, receives from that interaction. Um, this, this is essentially fundamentally what, what businesses do, and this is what uh, Theodore Levitt was talking about. <clears throat> so we have these, um, a series of, of uh, approaches already in our toolkit that we use, like the, the diagram that I showed from Sophia. And we also have customer journey maps and experience maps and service blueprints and mental model diagrams and ecosystem maps. We have this class of document, this activity that we're already experts at, that again, I believe go, kind of go beyond just optimization of an interface or incremental improvements, that what we can show here is value alignment. We can show businesses, we can start having conversations around how do you create value and how do you create shared value. <clears throat> and I call all of these actually alignment diagrams. It's something I talk about in my book. Um, alignment diagrams is, is simply a term that categorizes them. It's just an umbrella term. It's not a thing. It's not a, a method. It's basically just saying that we have this class of documents that actually has a strategic value to businesses because we can show value alignment with these with these documents. And I'm pretty much assuming that most people have heard or used those types of diagrams. Is that, is that correct? Everybody's nodding? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let me give you an example. I'm just going to flash a couple screens up here to show you what I mean by this principle of value alignment. If, if creating value is um, showing the interaction between an individual and an organization, that's what these types of diagrams fundamentally do. Here's an example of a customer journey map that I created. What you have here are phases of interaction here, becoming aware of the service, all the way to renewing or upgrading the service. And the top part tries to encapsulate the experience that the person has, right? Actions, thoughts, and feelings. So we describe the individual and what they're trying to get done. The bottom half describes what the organization does and which each department has to do at what, at what touch point. And then in the middle, we show that interaction, right? So at, at, at the highest level, um, a customer journey map qualifies in, by my definition as an alignment diagram because it shows this equation of, of value creation and value extraction. 
Um, an experience map, and some of, some of the differences here are only in name uh, only, by the way. Um, in fact, I, I encourage, like, as Vanessa, uh, Vanessa mentioned, that you have this, this collection of terms that overlap, um, and I'm really not concerned about the terminology. What I'm concerned about is the underlying principles that we see in each of these types of diagrams. There's an experience map created by Chris Risden of Adaptive Path for a service called Rail Europe. And if you're traveling through Europe, right, you, you plan and research your travel, and then you go, and then there's post-travel phase. And at the top, they describe the customer experience, and at the bottom, some opportunities for the organization. So again, you get this pattern of value creation and interaction. <clears throat> Here's a service blueprint. This is for attending a conference, right? So when you attend a conference, you register for the event, you go to the event all the way up to depart. And what this does is it shows what is the individual doing, what is the business, or in this case, the um, organizers of the event have to do, and where do they meet. Um, Sophia's model was a circle, and I just showed some tables from left to right kind of chronological, but there are other ways to show this as well, too. Um, this is a mental model diagram. Um, this is a, a method um, created by Indy Young. She wrote a book called Mental Models. Um, some of you may have heard of it. Um, and it's, it's actually more hierarchical than chronological. So what you do, it's a, it's a very prescribed method where you, you do first-hand research and then you, you build up a model hierarchically. You, you cluster tasks into towers and then those get grouped into mental spaces. And these documents can be very long. I'm only showing you two sections of about 15. So this would be a very, very long document. And then in this case, it's going to the cinema. What are all the things that people do, think, and feel? What philosophies do they have around going to the cinema? And it represents that pattern again, too, in the top we see some description of the, the person's mental model, and then down below you put all the features and support that an organization provides. What are all the ways that we support that interaction? Right. So we have this, we have this essentially this, this basic equation that is already baked in to these documents that, we, that, we are, that we're already experts at. But I believe we can, we can take these and have broader conversations within our organizations, and not just how can I make my project or my product better, but rather, we can start helping the business think in, those reverse, in that reversed way. What's the experience and how do we figure out the business model from there? Which is kind of my second point, that I think the aspiration of design with a capital D should be more than just delight, right? That we help realign the business perspective by visualizing actual value, right? We show that actual value. I think I just tweeted that out too. <laughs> I hope I did. <clears throat> but it's not the diagram. It's not the, 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 the answers are not in the diagram. In fact, you have to be very, very selective what goes into that diagram. And you're actually, you're actually going to exclude more than you include. Because when you talk about an experience, it's a big fuzzy thing, right? There's emotions. There's, there's all kinds of, of messy human uh, nature involved in describing an experience. So you have to be judicious about what you're going to include and what you're not going to include, depending on your situation and depending on the audience of these documents, right? Um, so, the, so the answer isn't going to come from the document itself, because here's what you're not going to do. If you've ever done a customer journey mapping uh, project or service blueprint project, here's what you don't do. You don't do all the research and create the diagram and then put it as an email attachment and say, hey, what do you guys think about it? That's not the end of, the, that's not the end of that effort. The end of the effort is, hey, let's all gather around this, because they're compelling artifacts, right? And they actually leverage our skills as designers to create a compelling artifact to show that value creation equation. And we take them into workshops or we hang them in the halls with blue tech. And we work, we work with um, our, our teams and our stakeholders to create this shared meaning around what does it mean to create value for customers? How do we do that, right?